So this is extract 24 of Terry Pratchett's Truckers. From the Book of Gnome, Exits, chapter 1, verse 1. Run to the lifts. Lifts, won't you carry me? Run to the walls. Walls, won't you hide me? Run to the lorry. Lorry, won't you take me? All on that day. It started with silence when there should have been noise. All the gnomes were used to the distant thumping and murmuring of the humans during the long daylight hours, so they didn't notice it. Now it was gone, they could hear the strange, oppressive silence. There were days, of course, when humans didn't come into the store. For instance, Arnold Brothers, established 1905, sometimes allowed them almost a week off between the excitement of Christmas fair and the hurly-burly of winter sale starts today. But the gnomes were used to this. It was part of the gentle rhythm of store life. This wasn't the right day. After several hours of silence, they just stopped telling one another not to worry. It was probably just some other special day or something. Like that time when the store had shut for a week for redecoration and one or two of the braver or more inquisitive ones risked a quick glance above floor level. Emptiness stretched away between the familiar counters and there didn't seem to be much stock around. It's always like this after a sale, they said, and, and then before you know where you are, all the shelves are filled up again. Nothing to get upset about at all. It's, it's all part of Arnold Brothers, established 1905's great plan. And they sat in silence, or hummed a little tune, or found something to occupy their minds, to stop thinking unpleasant thoughts. It didn't work. And then... When the humans came in and started taking the few things that were left off the shelves and counters and piling them in great boxes and taking them down to the garage and loading them onto the lorries and, and started taking up the floorboards, Mastin awoke. People were prodding him. Somewhere in the distance, other people were shouting. They were somehow familiar. Get up, quickly, said Gerda. What's happening, said Maskin, yawning. Humans are taking the store to bits. Maskin sat bolt upright. They can't be. It's not time, he said. They're doing it just the same. Maskin stood up, struggling into his clothes. He jigged sideways across the floor, one leg out of his trousers and thumped the thing. Hey, he said. You said the demolition wasn't for ages yet. Fourteen days, said the thing. We're starting now. This is probably the removal of remaining stock to new premises and preliminary works, said the thing. Oh, good. Well, that should make everyone feel a lot better. Why didn't you tell us? I was not aware that you did not know. Well, we didn't. So, so what do you suggest we do now? Leave as soon as possible. Masklin snarled. He had expected two more weeks to solve all the problems. They could have stockpiled stuff to take with them. They could have had proper plans. Even two weeks was hardly long enough. Now even the thought of one week was a luxury. He went out into the milling, disorganised crowd. Fortunately, the boards hadn't been taken up in an inhabited area. Some of the more sensible refugees said that only a few had been taken up in the far end of the gardening department so the humans could get at the water pipes, but gnomes living nearby were taking no chances. There was a thump overhead. A few minutes later, a breathless gnome appeared and reported that the carpets were being rolled up and taken away. That caused a terrified silence. Maskin realised that they were all looking at him. Uh he said. Then he said, I think everyone ought to get as much food as they can carry and go down to the basement near to the garage. Y you mean, you still think we should do it? said Gerda. We haven't got much choice, have we? But we were, you said we should take as much as we could from the store, all the wire and tools and things and books, said Gerda. <laughs> we'll be lucky, we can just take ourselves, there's no time. Another messenger came running up. It was one of Dorcas's group. He whispered something to Maskin, who gave a strange smile. Can it be that Arnold Brothers established 1905 has abandoned us in our hour of need? said Gerda. 
I don't think so, said Masklin. He may actually be helping us because, well, you'll never guess where the humans are putting all this stuff. From the Book of Gnome, Exits, Chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. And the outsider said, Glory to the name of Arnold, brothers, established 1905, for he have sent us a lorry, and the humans are loading it now with all manner of things needful for gnomes. It is a sign. Everything must go, including us. Half an hour later, Maskin lay on the girder with Dorcas, looking down at the garage. He had never seen it so busy. Humans sleepwalked across the floor, carrying bundles of carpet into the backs of some of the lorries, Yellow things, like a cross between a very small lorry and a very large armchair, inched around them, stacking boxes. Dorcas passed him the telescope. Busy little things, ain't they? he said conversationally. They've been at it all morning, they have. A couple of lorries already come out and gone back, so they can't be going very far. The letter we saw said something about a new store, said Masklin. Perhaps they're taking the stuff there. Could be. It's mostly carpets at the moment and some of the big frozen humans from fashions. Masklin made a face. According to Gerda, the big pink humans that stood in fashions and kiddies clothes and young living and never moved at all were those who had incurred Arnold Brothers established 1905's displeasure. They had been turned into horrible pink stuff and some said they could even be taken apart. But certain Cloffian philosophers said no. They were particularly good humans who had been allowed to stay in the store forever and not made to disappear at closing time. Religion was very hard to understand. As Masklin watched, the big roller door creaked upwards and a lorry nearby started with a roar and ground slowly out into the blinding daylight. What we need, he said, is a lorry with a lot of stuff from the ironmongery department. Wire, you know, and tools and things. Have you seen any food? They look like a lot of stuff from the food hall on the first lorry out, said Dorcas. No. We'll have to make do then. What I'll do, said Dorcas slowly, if they load it all up on a lorry and drive it away. Oh God, they're working powerfully hard for humans. Surely they can't empty the store in one day, said Masklin. Dorcas shrugged. Who knows, he said. You'll have to stop the lorry from leaving then, said Masklin. How? I throw myself under it. Any way you can think of, said Masklin. Dorcas grinned. All right, I'll find a way. Lad's getting used to this place. Refugees were flowing into the ironmongery department from all over the store, filling all the space under the floor with a frightened buzz of whispered conversation. Many of them looked up as Masklin walked past and what he saw in their faces terrified him. They believe I can help, he thought. They're looking at me as if I'm their only hope. But I don't know what to do. Probably none of the things I'm thinking of will work. We should have had more time. He forced himself to look as if he was brimming with confidence. And that seemed to satisfy people. All they wanted to know was that someone, somewhere, knew what they were doing. Masklin wondered who it was, because it certainly wasn't him. The news was bad from everywhere. A lot of the gardening department had been cleared. Most of the clothes department was empty. The counters were being ripped out of cosmetics, although fortunately not many gnomes lived there. Masking could hear, even hear, the thud and crunch of the work going on. Finally, he could stand it no longer. Too many people kept staring at him. He went back down to the garage where Dorcas was still watching from his spy post on top of the girder. What's happened? said Maskin. The old gnome pointed to the lorry immediately below him. That's the one we want, he said. It's got all sorts in it. Lots of stuff from the do-it-yourself department. And there's even some haberdashery things, needles and whatnot. All the stuff you told me to look out for. We've got to stop them driving it out, said Masklin. Dorcas grinned. The machinery that raises the door won't work, he said. The fuse has gone. What's the fuse, said Masklin. Dorcas picked up a long, thick red bar lying by his feet. This is, he said. You took it. Tricky job. We had to tie a bit of string round it. it. made a powerful big spark when we pulled it out. 
but I expect they can put another one in, said Maskelyne. Oh, they did, said Dorcas, with a self-satisfied expression. <laughs> They're not daft. Didn't work through, because after we took the fuse out, the lads went and cut the wires inside the wall in a couple of places. Very dangerous. They'll take the humans forever to find it. Hmm. But supposing they leave the door up? That won't do them any good. It's not as if the lorry will go anyway. Why not? Dorcas pointed downwards. Masklin watched, and after a moment saw a couple of small figures scurry out from under the lorry and dive into the shadows by the wall. They were carrying a pair of pliers. A moment later, a sor solitary figure hurried after them, dragging a length of wire. Powerful lot of wires them lorries need, said Dorcas. This one ain't got so much now. Funny, isn't it? Take away a tiny spark and the lorry won't go, but don't worry. I reckon we'll know where to put it all back later.